Chapter 15, One of Us is Lying. Addie, Tuesday, October 9th, 8.45 a.m. Somehow Bronwyn and Nate managed to dodge the cameras. Cooper and I weren't as lucky. We were both on the 5 o'clock news on all the major San Diego channels. Cooper, Cooper behind the wheel of his Jeep Wrangler, me climbing into Ashton's car after I had abandoned my brand new bike at, at school and sent her panicked text begging for a ride. Channel 7 News ended up with a pretty clear shot of me, which they put a side by side with an old picture of eight year old me at Little Miss Southeast San Diego pageant, where naturally I was second runner up. At least there weren't any vans when Ashton pulled up to drop me off to school the next day. Call me if you need a ride again, she says. I'll give her I give her a quick quick strangle hold hug. I thought I'd been more comfortable showing sisterly affection after last week's last weekend's cry fest but it's still awkward and i managed to snag my bracelet on her sweater sorry i mutter and she gives me a, a pained grin we'll get better at that eventually i've gotten used to stairs so the fact so to the fact that they've intensified since yesterday doesn't faze me since i when i leave class in the middle of history it's because my period is coming on and i and not because i have to cry but when i arrive in the girls room someone else is muffled Muffled sounds come from the last stall before whoever is there gets a, a whole, gets control of herself. I take care of my business, false alarm, and wash my hands, staring at my tired eyes and surprisingly bouncing hair. No matter how awful the rest of my life is, my hair still manages to look good. I'm about to leave and I hesitate and head for the other end of the restroom. I lean down and see scuffed black combat boots from under the last stall. Janae? No answer. I wrap my knuckles against the door. It's Addie. Do you need anything? Jesus, Addie, Janae says in a strangled voice. No, go away. Okay, I say, but I don't. You know, I'm usually the one that's in the stall bawling my eyes out, so I have a lot of Kleenexes if you need some. Also, by Zine. J Janae doesn't say anything. I'm sorry about Simon. I don't suppose it means much given everything you've heard, but I was shocked by what happened. You must miss him a lot. Janae stays silent, and I wonder if I stuck my foot in my mouth again. I'd always thought Janae was in love with Simon, and he was oblivious. Maybe she finally told him the truth before he died, and got rejected. That would make the whole thing even worse. I'm about to leave when Janae heaves a deep sigh. The door opens, revealing a blotchy face and a black-on-black -black clothing. I'll take that by Zine, she says, wiping her raccoon eyes. You should take the Kleenex, too, I suggest best pressing both into her hand. She snores out something like a laugh. How the mighty have fallen, Addie. You never talked to me before. Did that bother you? I asked, genuinely cur curious. Janae never struck me as someone who wanted to be part of our group, unlike Simon, who was always prowling around edges, looking for a way in. Janae wets a Kleenex under the sink and dabs at her eyes, glaring at me in the mirror the whole time. Screw you, Addie. Seriously, what kind of question is that? I'm not as offended as I normally be. I don't know, a stupid one, I guess. I'm only just realizing I suck at social cues. Janae squirts a stream of Izine into both eyes. Her raccoon circles reappear. I hand her another Kleenex so she can repeat the wiping process. Why? Turns out Jake's the one who was popular, not me. I was riding coattails. Janae takes a step back from the mirror. I never thought I'd hear you say that. I'm large. I contain multitudes, I tell her. And her eyes widen. A song of myself, right? Walt Whitman. I've been reading it since Simon's funeral. I don't understand most of it, but it's comforting in a weird way. Janae keeps stabbing at her eyes. That's what I thought. It was Simon's favorite poem. I think about Ashton and how she kept me sane over the last couple weeks, and Cooper, who's defended me at school even though there's no real friendship between us. Do you have anybody to talk to? No, Janae mutters and her eyes fill again. I know from experience she won't thank me for continuing the conversation. At some point, we need to suck it up and get to class. Well, if you want to talk to me, I have a lot of time and space next to me in the cafeteria, so open invitation or whatever. Anyway, I'm really sorry about Simon. See you. All things considered, I think it went pretty well. She stopped insulting me towards the end anyway. I return to history, but it's almost over, and after the bell rings, it's time for lunch, my least favorite part of the day. I told Cooper to stop sitting with me because he can't stand the hard time everyone else gives him, but I hate eating alone. I'm about to skip and go to the library when a hand plucks at my sleeve. Hey, 
It's Bronwyn, looking surprisingly fashionable in a fitted blazer and striped flats. Her hair is down, spilling over her shoulders in a glossy dark layers, and I notice with a stab of envy how clear her skin is. No giant pimples for her, I'll bet. I'm not sure I've ever seen Bronwyn looking this good, but I'm so distracted that I almost miss her next words. Do you want to eat lunch with us? Ah, I tilted my head at her. I've spent more time with Bronwyn in the last two weeks than I have really in the last three years at school, but this, but it isn't exactly, it hasn't exactly been social. Really? Yeah, well, we have some stuff in common now, so Bronwyn trails off, her eyes flicking away from mine, and I wonder if she ever thinks I might be the one behind all of this. She must, because I think it's about her sometimes, but in a evil genius, cartoon villain sort of way. Now that she's standing in front of me with cute shoes and tentative smile, it seems impossible. All right, I say. I follow Bronwyn to the table with her sisters, with her sister Yumiko, Mori, and some tall, solemn-looking girl I don't know. It's better than skipping lunch at the library. When I get out front after the last bell, there's nothing, no vans, no reporters, so I text Ashton that she doesn't have to pick me up, and I take the opportunity to ride my bike home. I stop at the extra long red light and hurley, resting my feet on the pavement as I look at the stores in the strip mall by my right. Cheap clothes, cheap jewelry, cheap cellular, and cheap haircuts. Nothing like a, a usual salon in downtown San Diego, which charges $60 every six weeks to keep split ends at bay. My hair feels hot and heavy under the helmet, weighing me down. Before the light changes, I angle my bike off the road and over the sidewalk into the mall parking lot. I lock my bike on the rack outside, supercuts, pull off the helmet, and go inside. Hi, the girl behind the register is only a few years older than me, wearing a flimsy black tank top that exposes colorful flower tattoos covering her arms and shoulders. Are you here for a trim? A cut. Okay, we're not super busy, so I can take you right now. She directs me to a cheap black chair that's losing its stuffing, and we both gaze in my direction in the mirror as she runs her hands through my hair. This is so pretty. I stare at the shining locks in her hands. I need it to come off. A couple inches? I shake my head. All of it. She laughs nervously. To your shoulders, maybe? All of it, I repeat. Her eyes widen in alarm. Oh, you don't mean that. Your hair is beautiful. She disappears from behind me and reappears with the supervisor. They stand there, conferring for a few minutes in hushed tones. Half the salon is staring at me. I wonder how many of them saw San Diego news last night, and how many of them think I'm an overly hormonal teenager, teenage girl. Sometimes people think they want a dramatic cut, but they really don't. A supervisor starts cautiously. I don't let her finish. I'm beyond tired of people telling me what I want. Do you guys do haircuts here, or should I go somewhere else? She tugs at a lock of her own bleach blonde hair. I'd hate for you to regret this. If you want a different look, you could try. Shears lie across the counter in front of me. I reach for them. Before anyone can stop me, I grab a thick handful of hair and chop the whole thing off above my ear. Gas run through the salon, and I meet a tattooed girl shocked eyes in the mirror. Let's fix it, I tell her. So she does.